Hi, I'm Cam Merkel with Razortip Industries and uh, welcome to the International Association of Woodcarvers presentation. All right, everybody, thank you all for joining us again today. Um, today is March the 26th, 2022, and uh, we're actually starting a little bit later today, a little bit after 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming in today on this Saturday afternoon to join us with the International Association of Woodcarvers. Uh, today, we have a special guest on uh, with us from uh, Canada. Uh, Mr. Cam Merkel is going to come on and talk to us about his company, Razor Tip. Uh, which is a wood burning company. Uh, he'll be talking a little bit about bird carving, uh, utilizing uh, pins and uh, wood burning to enhance your carvings. Uh, so we'll have Cam on here in just a few minutes. Uh, before we uh, turn it over to him, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the presenters that's coming up in the coming weeks. Uh, before this meeting, we met with Steve Tomaszek. He's going to come to us from Germany. Uh, and he's going to be talking to us about miniatures next Saturday. Uh, we'll be back on, on next Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so make sure you join us next Saturday. Again, Steve Tomaszek, you can see him out on Instagram and on YouTube, uh, so make sure you check out his work uh, when you get a chance. Uh, I talked to Joe Yu uh, yesterday, and Joe's going to come on on April the 9th. Um, he's going to be talking about um, using clay armatures and actually creating your own patterns from clay, so uh, Joe Hughes, a CCA member, he's going to be coming on with us again on April the 9th. Uh, Chris Hammett is going to come on on April the 16th. He's also a CCA member. Uh, he's going to come on and talk to us about the uh, show that's coming up in September that the CCA is doing. Uh, that's Carving the Rockies. That's in September on the 24th and 25th. Uh, make sure you join us that day on April the 16th to hear from Chris. Uh, Brett Andrews is going to be coming in on April the 23rd. Uh, he's going to be uh, doing a demonstration and talking to us about uh, his carving journey. Uh, the crank lady, uh, Cecilia Schiller, is going to be coming on on April the 30th. Uh, she's going to be doing a demonstration on uh, some of her uh, moving wood carvings. Uh, that should be an interesting show, so make sure you join us on April the 30th. Uh, Dana from uh, Carving Junkie, she's on with us today. She's going to be coming on on May the 14th. Uh, she's also doing an article in our newsletter that's going to be sent out uh, on April the 1st, so look for that. Uh, she's uh, willing to contribute to our newsletter, so uh, we look forward to having Dana on there on the 14th. Uh, I skipped uh, Ken Kahur. Kahur. Ken's going to be on on April, or I'm sorry, on May the 7th, uh, so look forward to hearing from Ken. He's from up in the Pennsylvania area, and then uh, Dylan Goodson's going to be coming on on May the 21st. Uh, if you all know Dylan, he does relief carving. He also does carving in the round, He's got some classes coming up and he's going to be uh, coming on and talking to us in May. So look forward to that. Uh, just to remind everybody that all of our uh, videos are out on YouTube from all of our past meetings. Uh, I think we're at number 88 or 89. So make sure you go out and check those out on YouTube. Uh, we also have quick cuts, which are smaller uh, videos out there from past meetings. So you can go out and check those out. If you don't have time to watch a full meeting, uh, check those out. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe our channel out there. Again, today we have on Cam Merkel. Uh, Cam's coming to us from uh, Canada. He's going to talk a little bit about how he started uh, Razor Tip and all the offerings they have there and how he uses his burners uh, to enhance the uh, carvings that he does. So at this time, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Cam. I appreciate you coming on today and we look forward to hearing from you. Hey, uh, thanks a lot, Blake. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm glad that we could make this work. Um, welcome to everybody, wherever you happen to be, from uh, sunny Martinsville, Saskatchewan, in the in the heart of the prairies. Um, so everybody was beforehand talking a little bit about the weather and that kind of thing, and snowing in parts of the U.S. And it's not snowing; it's sunny here today, but it's uh, minus seven degrees Celsius. So it's still a kind of a crisp spring day. I'm glad that I can uh, have an opportunity to share this, to share a little bit of uh, my passion for, my main passion is bird carving, but I've been a carver all my life. Uh, just a little bit of background. I, I've literally been carving since I was like six or seven years old. My, my brother and my dad and I would go on fishing trips and I would take a piece of firewood and try to carve a fishing lure out of it. And I, I don't know where the carving bug came from. I'm kind of unique in our family that way, but it's always been with me. And uh, later on, as a more of a uh, growing up, I got more interested in the photography industry. I've always had interest in electronics, photography, woodworking, birds, nature, outdoors, that kind of stuff. So um, 
in working in the photo industry, um, I had an opportunity to take a, a bird carving class in September of 1983 from a world champion carver named Paul Burdett uh, from Orton, Ontario. It, this class is in Winnipeg, and uh, I went to Winnipeg and took the class and got thoroughly hooked on bird carving at that time. Prior to that, I'd been carving little scale models of cameras and things like that, and a few stylized birds and animals and things of that nature. So I, I'd always been doing carving, but um, when I got hooked on the bird carving thing, you needed a wood burning tool in order to put the feathers on the birds. And um, I bought an inexpensive wood burner from Paul Burdett and it just wasn't doing the job. It was more like a soldering iron type thing. It wasn't very good for birds. And in fact, behind me uh, right here is the, the little bird that we carved in that, in that uh, workshop in September, 1983 with Paul Burdett. So that's my first bird carving right there. And the wood burner didn't work all that great. So I upgraded to a more expensive one, which had hot wire tips and uh, that didn't last very well. The tips didn't last very well. Uh, with my experience working on photo finishing equipment, I kind of did a post-mortem on these pens and figured out that there was a design flaw in the way the tips went in and they weren't gonna last very long. So I set about to design my own pen. Again, this was in 1983, early 1984. And uh, by then I was already selling in a, a local gallery that was nearby where I worked, selling a lot of bird carvings. And uh, I had a bunch of people approach me to start teaching classes on bird carving. I was an expert in the photo industry, but I felt a real neophyte in bird carving. And, and these guys, I said, I'm not sure if I can teach this, if, if I can really do such a thing, teach a class, I'm just getting started. And they said, well, you know more than we do. So why don't you just share with us, which has kind of become a bit of a motto for a lot of wood carvers. And so I did that. And in the process, though, they needed a wood burning tool. There wasn't really anything on the market that was available up here anyway. Um, so I started making my own burners and, and just selling them to the guys in the class thinking, oh, the odd one here and there, never dreaming that it would ever become a, a company or a, a business of any sort. But anyway, one thing to another, and then the, the pens invariably would fail and they'd bring them back to me and I would figure out why they failed and, and keep on working that way. And right from the first minute I started making these pens, um, I stood behind them and that has never changed even to this day with razor tip industries nearly 40 years later. Um, and uh, just one thing led to another and I started carving more and selling more carvings and teaching classes. And when I was teaching classes, I needed to have a reliable source for carving supplies like the eyes and the feet and the wood and the, all the other things that we use cutters and tools. And so I, with a background in photo retail, I, I started selling some carving supplies just on the side and, and everything just kind of kept growing. And one day I woke up and realized I either got to get right into this carving, the wood burning tools and the carving supplies or get right out of it because it's taking up a lot of my carving time. And uh, <clears throat> obviously it's obvious where I decided to go. And since then, um, just been blessed with the growth of the company and, uh, you know, I've had always had a passion for making things as, as good as I possibly can. So I've been the primary designer, um, you know, with, again, with a background in electronics and, and the physics and chemistry side of photography, a very technical. Um, I've been primarily designing a lot of what we've what we've built. And over the years, starting with just one wood burner, now we've got about six different power supplies and expansion modules and all kinds of stuff over 900 different tips that we make which is still kind of mind-blowing to me but even with all those tips that we make uh, there's still times where somebody will come up and say I need a tip to do this and we have to design a different one yet so um, it, it never ever stops so what I wanted to share with you today um, again is just uh, with thanks Blake and Tom for in inviting me and and getting me, uh, giving me the opportunity to share my passion. Um, what I wanted to share is just a, a little bit of an overview on a number of things that you can do with wood burning pens, because although my main passion is bird carving, and, and I'm very passionate about it, I've competed at the world champion level, championship level since 2007, had the fortune of winning second in the world in 09 and uh, third in the master's class in, in 2010. So I've, I've had some success and I've been very, very fortunate. Um, but it is a big passion, but a lot of people sort of put you in a bit of a box and, oh, you're a bird carver. And yes, I am, but I have also done, uh, pretty much every other kind of carving you can imagine from relief to carving on turnings to doing caricature and animals and, uh, fishing lures and you name it. If it, it's, I've got a real passion for working with wood at the top of it is the birds. So, you know, I'll show a little bit about how uh, we use the tools as bird carvers. And then I wanted to do a quick little demo on putting scales on a fish. Um, I've got a little kind of a 
I don't know, just a little piece of a fish that I carved here the other day that I've set up so I can sort of show you what scale making is like. Um, but with both bird carving and fish carving, the primary objective for most bird carvers and fish carvers is to prepare a surface, a textured surface that you can paint on. And that's the most important thing for a lot of us is, is it's not about the burning, what it looks like when you're done burning. It's more, what does it look like after you put the paint on it? And I know with a lot of caricature carvers, an example, most caricature carvings are painted. And uh, there's a lot of things you can do with a wood burning tool on a caricature carving that will show through the paint and give you a, a very quick and easy way of putting details on things like buttonholes or hair on eyebrows or, you know, even scars or zippers or, you know, things of that nature, shoelaces. So just give you a little bit of information on that. And of course, with 900 different tips, it's impossible for me to talk about all of them in a, in a short period, but I just wanted to kind of cover some of the basic kinds and some of the most more popular things that, that we've identified over the years. Touch a little bit on the, on the kind of power supplies that we produce, that we offer. And uh, I definitely want to leave a lot of room for question and answer. I, I think that's a really important part. There's a lot of people have, have a lot of questions for us over the years. So uh, with that in mind, I just, uh, I may as well get started and do a little bit of a uh, little bit of burning here. I've got, um, I don't know if you guys want to switch over to the, the birds there. There we go. I've got a, uh, uh, like you see, the little fish that I did here that I'll, I'll demonstrate some scale making on. Got an example of, of a number of the different tips and pens that we make. Um, there's a variety of different things here. I'll talk about those. And to start with, I just wanted to just show a little bit on, on with, a, with a bird carving. Typically, you know, we'll carve a bird and we'll get it so that I've got, you know, another little, another red winged black bird here that I had carved that is getting ready to start burning a few feathers on. Uh, you can really do a lot of carving on feathers if you wish, or you can leave things fairly smooth. There's lots of options that way. Um, but we get to a point where we draw feathers on the bird and then we start start burning those feathers on and there's structured feathers like the ones on the on the wing and the tail and then there's more hair like feathers like on the underside of the bird and on the head and essentially uh what i use is just a little sharp tip it can either be pointed or round um and i've got i should have everything set up yeah i'm this particular one i'm burning very very hot if you talk to 10 different bird carvers you'll find 10 different techniques for burning feathers um you know, or 12 different techniques for burning feathers. Just like if you talk to a fish carver, they, they all have different ideas on what's the best way to burn scales on their fish. Um, we try to make sure that whatever your, your area of interest is, um, whatever technique you like doing, we would have a tool that would, that would accomplish that for you. But in this particular case, I'm burning quite hot. You can see the, the burning is very, very dark. And it's just a matter of, of varying up. I'm changing the angle, twisting the pen a little bit as I go into the wood. So I'm not just making a whole bunch of parallel lines. I'm, I'm creating lines that are, that are kind of random, um, almost like I'm creating just little feather, 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 you know, with, with kind of fanning it out and overlapping. This is very easy. Uh, it's not stressful or anything like that to go over this. You just basically keep twisting things up and fill in the area. It is very helpful to take a pencil and draw in your flow lines first before you start burning. Otherwise, you could get off on a, on a bit of a track that, that you really don't want to get off to. Um, so some people burn very dark. Others, like I've got a, a little wren here that I carved. Um, and you can see the feather detail on this guy is a lot more, uh, it's a lot lighter and it's a lot finer. This was done using the same basic techniques uh, as what I just did on the, on the bluebird um, that I was burning. But uh, I, I do it in a much lower heat setting. It allows me to burn finer detail. For some of the structured feathers, um, you know, like a, a tail feather on the bird, that kind of thing, we would use a, a tip that is that we use kind of more flat like this. And uh, you would use that to, to push down um, either side of a feather shaft. And uh, when you push down either side of the feather shaft, like I've done on the, on the wing tips here, you can see I've, before I burned the feather detail in, I just pushed down the, uh, pushed, pushed down either side of that feather shaft. And I went down and did that all the way down on these feathers and then took a fine little sharp tip, something like this, 
a uh, little sharp skew and I went in there and I burned all these little lines in. They're done one at a time. Um, kind of going. So as you can see from that, it's very time consuming. And uh, a lot of people kind of like view it almost like knitting. You know, you, you can sit down, you can lose hours and hours and hours and kind of get yourself lost in the process. Many people just love the process of burning. And uh, for others, it's not quite as enjoyable. We do have another, uh, another product here that a lot of the bird carvers use. These are a, a special kind of tip that we make that's called a feather former. And what these are is these are a, a tip that's made up of a wrapped wire. So the, the wire itself has wrappings around it and they're available in different shapes. You can see there's a, a number, of different, number of different shapes here that, uh, that the feather formers come in and they come in like different coarsenesses. Uh, you can get fine, medium, coarse, extra coarse and, and everything right down to super kind of ridiculously fine. Um, but what I have is, um, with this with this feather former tip i'll switch this over the idea behind this is now that instead of burning one line at a time you would take the tip and you would burn in like on this wren i've got the two different wrens here that i've that i've done on this wren i've used the feather former tips to burn in the feather detail and uh, again, the goal is to prepare a rough or a textured surface in preparation for painting. And in reality, the feather former's surface is easier to paint because your, your burning details have kind of round, shallow valleys where if you burn with a sharp tip like this, your, your valleys are sharp and your peaks are sharp. Where if you use a feather former because of the nature of it, the valleys are round bottom and the peaks are not very high, but they're nice and sharp. And it makes it easier to paint a bird if it's been textured with a feather former. In addition to burning feathers on your bird carvings, these feather former tips can also be used for burning hair on animals uh, or on, on like people, caricatures, mustaches, that kind of stuff. Um, just kind of in preparation, one of, the, one of the other things that I do I want to make sure of is that I'm, uh, I should probably turn my heat on. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the burners in, in, in a few minutes here. Um, I forgot to turn on the heat to this to this pen when I was talking. So feather formers take a little bit of time to heat up. And uh, yeah, that's I got it on the right one. I don't want it to be too hot. You see the heat coming out here now. I'm not sure if you can you should be able to see a little bit of heat developing there. The idea with feather formers, I don't want them really, really hot. I want to be able to dwell in the wood for a little bit. And each time I pull it like this, I'm making a number of different a number of different uh, marks in the wood. I'm not just doing one line at a time. So I'm going to take this little row. I'm going to take this little row of covert feathers here, and I'm just going to lay the feather former down. This little bird's carved out of Tupelo, and the test board that I was using there is basswood, so this tip is a little hotter than, than what it was. when I, a little hotter than it needs to be in the Tupelo, but it would be, if I don't push real hard and go kind of slow, it still works really, really well. And so then I'll just flip it over and sometimes it's very helpful to just blow across the tip before you put it into the wood so that it cools it off just a little bit. So it's not super hot going into the wood. All of these tips take a certain amount of time to recover their heat. They don't recover it necessarily instantly. And uh, sometimes if you wait too long between burning, um, you know, setting it down, it can, it can heat up quite a bit between, between uh, sessions. So, you know, that's kind of the, the process of just burning in multiples. If you're doing more, more of the hair-like feathers on the bird, you can just take it and just kind of go over the, much like I did on the hair-like feathers on that bluebird earlier with the single point tip. I just use the, the edge of this and I'm creating a, a rough surface that I, that I can paint on later on. So I'm just breaking up the smoothness of the surface on here when I do these. And as you can see by what I've done here, it doesn't take all that long to go over and get the whole, I'm just gonna, cool this tip off a little bit for the Tupelo I had set it up. 
Uh, it doesn't take that long to go over the whole bird with these hair-like textures. This is a little more appropriate heat setting now. I've, I've cooled the tip off just a little bit. It's not quite as hot, so I don't have to worry as much about burning a hole in the wood when I touch it down. It's really important to get your, your tip to the right temperature. And then when I get some of these other tips on like the undertail cover, or cover these, these other feathers, um, you just use it like a multi-line tip and you can come around and create those, burn in those feathers in a fraction of the time that it would take you if you're doing them one, one line at a time. So you can see the difference in the two there. And uh, anyway, so that's, that's kind of the, the basics on burning feathers on birds, um, single line or uh, with a feather former tip. I don't know if this is uh, Tom and Blake, I'll leave it up to you whether, is this a good time to, to um, open up for questions on the bird carving or the bird feathers? Yeah, that's good. Go ahead, Ken. Anybody have any questions, go ahead and speak up. I have a question. My name is Denise and I'm new here. Um, I fell in love with wood burning. Um, I do like um, not per se carvings. I work with the, um, the round pieces and uh, some of the, the flats, the ones that has the, um, the tree barks on the side. And I do um, whatever ca catches my fancy like um, lions or um, other things like that, um, panda bears. And I um, use the graphite paper to put the image on the wood and then I burn it that way. Um, I'm having trouble finding a really good uh, burning tool. And many people have has talked about the razor tips. Can you use these razor tips um, for the what I'm doing, like the imagery and um, you know, trying to make them look really nice? You can um, use the, the feather, the bird feather tip to um, create um, some kind of uh, hair or whatever on the things that I'm working on? Yeah, um, the, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, there are thousands of people using the, the razor tip tools for exactly what you're talking about, uh, just a general pyrography um, more than anything else. And um, the feather former tips are used by many artists to create on, on flat surfaces. If you're creating uh, pictures where you're just burning on the wood slabs or, or uh, things of that nature. Um, it, I think of the tips and the wood burning pen a lot like you'd think of a paintbrush. You know, there's, there's so many different kinds of paintbrushes out there. And one artist will use one kind of brush, another artist will use the other kind of brush, depending on the kind of work they want to do. But the feather formers are used a lot for flat work as well. They were originally designed for bird carvers, but they've since been used by a lot of others. And I know with, with the different power supplies that we have, and uh, the, the pens and the cords and all the other options, there's, there's no end of, of things that you can do with our tools. If it can be done with pyrography tools, it can, it can be done by the tools that we make. Thank you, Cam. Um, another question. Um, the feather tool, um, is the razor tip uh, SK, does it have the feather, feather tools in it? That kit? Well, uh, no, the, the burner isn't sold specifically with feather former tips, but um, you can buy the, the SK burner with an interchangeable tip pen and you can buy a set of feather former tips for it separately. Okay. Uh, the feather formers is depending on the size and the kind of work you're doing, they're available in six different coarsenesses. Um, we got the, the finest ones called ridiculously fine and it burns like, I don't know, 300 lines per inch or some crazy thing like that for super miniature stuff. Um, and then all the way up to the extra course, which only burns uh, 20 lines per inch or 18 lines per inch. So you would have to determine which, which uh, kind of a texture or effect you'd want, depending on what you're doing. So uh, it's difficult for us to put kits together many times. We, we do have some kits for, like we have a pyrography kit for people just getting started with wood burning that's got our most popular tips, uh, four or five of the most popular tips for wood burners. And uh, like wood burning artists, we have a, a wood turner's kit and a carver's kit and a gourd artist kit. Like we put those different kits together to get people started. But with such a wide array of things available, um, you'd almost have to kind of, you know, the one of the best tools right now is I know there's a, a 
we have uh, our social media person Ashley puts a, uh, does a great job with our Instagram page and there's a lot of inspiring stuff on there showing how different tips are used and what different people are doing so uh, it's all available kind of or more a la carte than anything else and we, we do make six different power supplies the SK being our uh, it's kind of our flagship that's our most popular burner we sell a, a lot of those and it's it's kind of a bulletproof burner that's been around for uh, since I think 1997 or so um, and it's just proven it's it's metal um, but it's it's a good place it's kind of our entry level burner uh, we don't make any really inexpensive things we tried over the years and we just can't get anything that's reliable you know to get the price point below the SK um, you referenced question for you you referenced a minute ago about the, the thinness of some of your blades probably the skews and stuff some people recommend using sandpaper to refine the uh, width of the the, the uh, tip, but you sound like you sell tips that are narrow enough that you don't need to do that. How how do you see that being done? Yeah, well, this is this is a this tip here. I don't know if you can you know switch down to the switch to the view there, uh, Tom. There we go. This tip is one of our standard skews that we've been making for a long time, and. Uh, Right out of this one's right out of the package. I've, I just opened this one up yesterday in preparation for the, the show here. And this gives you an idea of, you know, I mean, that's, that's the tip right out of the package. Um, you know, it's, it's sharp enough that it'll, most of these tips are buffed and sharp enough that, that it'll cut, you know, and they're not a real strong tip. So I can't push real hard, but you can see it's actually cutting the wood. Um, most any of our little sharp tips, a little spear that we've got, We'll do the same thing. This is a, a little tiny spear tip that we make. So the, part of the thing with our product is you don't need to, you don't need to do anything with it. You open up the package, plug it in and start burning. Um, you don't have to strop. I, I don't think any of our competitors uh, really get to that level of, of uh, you know, polish. There, there may be one, you know, one that does, but most of them historically have just put a real rough blunt edge on the thing is up to you to hone it or refine it. Um, I want also just you know, bring that up. I want to mention one other thing is that when you're cleaning these tips, there's two really good ways to clean them, and uh, none of them involve any kind of anything abrasive. One of the, if you're using a tip that's uh, like a ball tip or something that's irregular shape, like a really weird shape tip or a ball of some sort, you can see the little ball shape on this guy. Um, we recommend just using a dense brass brush like this that that you can. You can just run this through and you can do that when the tip is hot so you don't have to unplug or turn things off you can just go that route the brass brush will work on a sharp tip as well but there's another process and this is a little tip cleaner that we make you see it's got a little v blade and uh, to use this one again you can use this one when the tip is hot you don't have to turn anything off you just take the tip and and run it through the little v and it'll scrape all the carbon off the face of the tip without wearing the tip out so you can use this kind of thing on any tip that you know like i've got a number of different sharp tips here that would all work for that even this little teeny tiny skew or spear um, you can use that the same way and, and clean the carbon off and it'll it'll mean that your tip isn't going to wear out and your tip stays the same shape and point you know all the all the other stuff stays the same if you use something abrasive two things happen one is you actually change the shape of the tip slowly over time. And the other one is that when you use the abrasive, it actually creates little microscopic scratches in the surface where you've done the abrasion. And then when you go and burn that, the scratches and abrasion create a rough surface that the burnt particles of wood, the carbon will actually stick to a lot more than if it was smooth and shiny. And it, your tip will actually carbon up quicker if you use something abrasive to clean it than if you scrape it. So, um, and, and with a brass brush, of course, it's much softer than the, than the tip metal. So um, it's not gonna damage or change the shape of your tip in any way, shape or form. So those are really the only two ways that we recommend cleaning. The other thing you can do is if you don't have the, the, the tip cleaner like this, um, or with some other tips, you can actually take a, an Olfa knife or something like that and just scrape the edge of the blade against the sharp part of the Olfa knife. I don't have one in front of me, but... Um, you know, just even like that with the uh, with a tip cleaning tool here, you can use the, there's some sharp edges here that you can use to scrape the carbon off the, the surface of your tip. So those are the, the cleaning methods. And if you do ever have to, um, 
reshape a tip if you wanted, for example, if you wanted to, to take this point and round it off a little bit, you can do that with a fine grinding tool and some buffing compound. And, you know, so you can re, re, reshape them to some extent or, or modify them. Um, I don't know if that, does that answer the question? And then some? Hey Cam, there's a uh, question in the chat as far as the uh, difference between the, the fixed tip pins and the changeable tip pins. Can you tell them the difference? Yeah, um, thank, that's a good question. We get that a lot. Um, we, we actually make two different kinds of pins, uh, two basic kinds of pins. We've got what we call our, our standard pins and our heavy duty pins. The standard pins are smaller. They use a lighter gauge wire. Everything's finer. Um, they're a little more tactile. They're smaller to hold on to. Uh, for fine detail work, these are generally the pins that are used for that. The heavy duty pen bodies are available either as a fixed tip pen or as an interchangeable tip pen. The, the pen bodies and everything else is the same. The difference being that on the one hand, we just weld the tips straight into the, we use laser welding and we weld the tips straight into the pens. Uh, the other one with the interchangeable tip pen, you can see there's a screw on uh, screw fitting on either side. And uh, you can actually change the tips just by loosening off these screws. You can pull the tip out and change to a different kind of tip, whatever, whatever kind of tip you want to do. You just drop it in there and then tighten up the screws and you're good to go. The advantage of the interchangeable tip pins are obviously that you can buy a, a set of tips or, or a variety of tips that you don't use as much. And the tips don't cost you. You don't have to make a massive investment. Um, you know, in round figures, you're talking about $35 for a pen with a fixed tip in it, and roughly the same for an interchangeable tip pen, and anywhere between maybe six and ten dollars for a replacement tip, um, depending on the actual tip and that kind of thing. So you can have a lot more bang for your buck if you're using interchangeable tips. The downside to them is if this, if you've only got one interchangeable tip pen and you're doing a bunch of burning with it and you want to change tips, now you've got a hot bit of stuff here that you have to deal with in, in order to change that tip over. So we usually find that if people like the idea of the interchangeable tip pen and if they use those a lot, it's a good idea to get at least two of them and sometimes three or four. And then what you would do is you'd kind of treat them like fixed tip pens. You'd, you'd almost uh, just treat them as though the tips are fixed and you're just changing pens. And if you need to down the road, you can, you can swap out the tips. And you're also doing so on a cool on a pen that isn't hot, you know, because there's these things, these connections here will stay hot for a while after you've turned the pen off because there's quite a bit of metal there. If one already has a different brand of interchangeable tip uh, pens, can your tips work on other brands? Some of them they can, um, generally speaking, not so much. Um, I know most of the, most of the interchangeable tip pens on the market that, that, we come across most of them uh, our tips won't work on um it's a real trial and error hit and miss thing uh, i know a lot of the the stuff that comes out of china has much much longer they they need much much longer um tips and you know our tips typically are you know this long the tips are made specifically for our burners and our pens uh to perform best and uh it's possible that they may work on that other pen, but, but for example, a lot of them have a, a little plastic holder that the tip is, is molded into, and uh, you have to buy tips that are made in those holders. They're, they're proprietary for that company, and our tips will not work on those, on those at all. Um, yeah, there's very few of them that really do in reality. Now, at the same time, if you've got another brand of pen um, that you're using. Uh, we do make adapter cords that'll let you put that pen on one of our power supplies, or we make adapter cords that let you put our pens on most of the other power supplies on the market right now. You know, not, not all of them, but you know, it's a good number of them. So another question in the chat there, Cam, uh, after burning so hot, what do you do uh, before you paint to get rid of the carbon on the uh, carbon? Hey, that's a great question. Um, what I what I do with my with my uh, my bird carvings is I take a uh, toothbrush <laughs> and it, just a just a regular toothbrush like this and just start brushing back and forth. Now um, I may have already brushed this guy in the past, but what happens when you go over it with this toothbrush here? You'll see on the mat little bits of of dark fleck, 
that ends up um, falling down on the mat. So that's that just cleans all the carbon out of the out of the surface, and then we seal it with a. Uh, some people use a lacquer-based sealer uh, or an alcohol-based sealer. Um, right now, there's unfortunately there's a little bit of a um, deficiency in the industry on on sealers. Um, we're looking at we've we've developed I developed a sealer that that um, really works well for our um, for our bird carving purposes. There used to be a product made in Colorado that was phenomenal, and uh, they they due to health reasons he kind of stopped making it and and became unavailable, and we've formulated a replacement for it. Our challenge right now is we're we're still having trouble getting shipping uh, shipping arrangements. It's alcohol based and and you'd think it'd be easier to get the shipping arrangements, but we're still not able to ship it, even though we have the product. So, um, you know, in the meantime, you can work with any kind of an alcohol based or lacquer based sealer. Uh, water based stuff generally doesn't work too good because it'll sometimes puff up the wood and cause things to swell and fill in some of your detail if you try doing that. So um yeah anyway and and if you're painting with oil paints and you can use oil based sealers you can just put the oil paint straight into the wood um they work really well for sealing i have a question uh is it easy enough to use a tip to sign your name on the bottom of a carving yeah the that was carving. one of the going to demonstrate shortly um i was just thinking if there's anything specifically about the bird carving we could otherwise we can just we can move on i can just go into a little bit of demonstration on uh how we put scales on fish this would be suitable if you're doing like a walking stick with a snake on it or you know any of that kind of stuff uh just more talking about different approaches to scale making if that will work for you guys and then and then i can talk about some of the things that that would be suitable for like little caricature or more utility carvings um and okay. including finding your name on your work okay um then what i'll do is i'll I'll get the uh, I'll get a scale tip going here. Um, I am uh, while I'm waiting for that to warm up. I may as well just talk a little bit about the the burners that I'm using here. Uh, somebody had referenced the SK earlier. Um, the SK is our is our just our standard little um, single single burner. Uh, pen plugs in here. I don't have this one plugged in right now, but your pen cord would plug in here. You set your heat setting wherever you need it. It goes from cool enough to hard, not even put a mark on a piece of wood all the way up to red hot when you're at the top. These are kind of the, the bulletproof. Um, they've become a standard. This is, this is still our most popular burner. We sell more of those than anything else. Uh, one step up in the upgrade to the department of that is our color SSD 10. It's essentially the same as the SK. Um, but it has, you can plug two pens in and you can toggle back and forth between the two pens. Otherwise it's virtually identical to the SK. Um, and it's, it's been around, that's our oldest burner. We've been making the SSDs since about 1992. Uh, we've, we've changed them. We upgrade them and change them and, and things like that over the years. So, but they're essentially the same features, same burner. Um, then we have a new, new burner here. This is one of our newest ones. It's called the SL1. It's, a uh, um, uh, digital readout uh, microprocessor controlled. It's got incredible range from the lowest edge. You can almost touch the tip with your fingers, not quite, it would still burn you, but almost that cool all the way up to incredibly bright cherry red. These things put out way more heat than our SKs and S2, SSDs do at the high end. Uh, one thing that's really important with all of these, all of our burners carry uh, ETL safety certification and and uh, they're really the only ones in the industry, um, for, for the most part, I think there's one other burner in the entire world that carries safety certifications besides ours. And um, then uh, this one's plugged in right now, so you can actually see it on here. This is the SL3. It's kind of the souped up version of that SL1. Um, the way these work is you've got your, your heat setting here. It goes from 1 to 100 or 1 to 99. And uh, you get your heat set wherever you want it, and to uh, you can change from. You can really probably see the light moving here. You can change from one channel to another. So you've got three different pens that you can plug in. You toggle between the three pens with this, and then um, each channel, as you see, I changed channels here. The heat setting changes. So channel one is set for 38 right now. Channel two is set for 
whatever it was, 38, 52, 29. And you can just adjust it wherever you want, but it'll stay at that setting every time you come back to that channel. So you can sort of have three pens preset at heats that you like. And then to turn the power onto the pen, again, you, you almost need to get this cord out of the way, but to turn the power onto the pen, you just turn on a power button here and this little light turns blue. Uh, it's indicating, it's flashing right now, indicating that there's no pen hooked up to the, to the cord. So if I, uh, I'll just turn that around so you can see the light. If I hook a pen up to it now, the little blue light stops flashing. It just to indicate everything's good to go. And now the pen's starting to heat up and uh, do the burning. So those are, those are our uh, um, basic, or, or I don't know what, not really call them basic burners, but the, that's the, the kind of non-digital non stuff that we make. These are where you turn a knob to adjust the heat settings. And what I'm using for the demo today is I'm using another burner that's, um, I've got two different burners here. I'll just explain a little bit about these. Um, the first one on the left here is called a P80. And then the one on the right is a P88. The P80 and P88 platform is a, is a modular platform. So when you buy a P80, you just get a burner that looks like this. So you've got a P80 now. Um, you can change your, your heat setting just by in, inputting the heat setting that you want, turn on power to the pen, um, turn off power to the pen. Again, when you turn on power to the pen, there's a blue light that starts blinking on the front here. If you've got a pen hooked up to it and it's all running, then the blue light will come on solid. You can adjust your heat settings up or down using sort of like tweaking a knob. You can adjust them up and down a little bit here. Um, you can turn off the beeper and you've got a memory feature here that automatically stores the last three heat settings that you used. This is what the P80 does. Um, you can expand it by adding another P80 expansion module to it. That's P80X that gives you basically two of these, each with their own independent heat settings. Or the newest one that we have in the digital platform is called the P88. And what the P88 does, it just has a lot more memory, uh, a lot more capabilities. And that's what I'm actually using for the demo today is the P88 because I've got all these different pens. It takes them a, a minute to boot up. They're actually a little computer. Um, and so I've got a, a screen on the P88 that looks much like the P80. Uh, you would input your heat settings. It has little different memory. It's got a, a little, this little X that you see on the bottom here is, this is your memory button. When it's on X, then you can input anything you want. It's not going into memory at all. But you have three different memory settings, memory one, memory two, memory three, each one's kind of independent. So you'd program those. And then you have these program screens that you can, that you can program as a user. And you'll see what I've done here. I've taken this number one, I just called that the hair tip. And that would be like this tip here that I was using. Um, and if I go to hair tip, then it's set at a heat setting of 395. And if I want to do the ball tip, which I'll be shining, si signing with later, I, 580 is the heat setting that, we're, that I want to use on that one. I want to go to a shader 545. That feather former that I used is set for 435. And you have eight different presets that you can do. You can, you can describe them in any way you want. You can describe them by temperature, or you can see with a, the scale tips. Um, I, I'm using the, uh, the, where's my scale tip? I've, I've got, I'm using this scaler right now, the scale tip. Um, and as it heats up, you can see I'm using that at, uh, it's set at 580. That's a preset. So anytime I go to a different pen, it'll automatically go back to the preset that I've done. I can adjust that and change it. And if the tip is too hot at 580 for the kind of wood that I'm using, I get a soft spot in the wood. I can drop the heat setting down a little bit, or I can bring it back up a little bit. And I can adjust, this is by 15 points up or down, but I can, on the P88, I can adjust that and make it so it adjusts by 20 or 30 or 40 or two points or whatever I want. So it's very, very versatile. And it, it gives you a lot of capability for um, if you're doing a lot of multiple stuff. Uh, it has, it goes from uh, about 100 degrees Celsius up to 800 degrees Celsius, which is very, very hot, bright, bright red. So that kind of, that's just a little bit of an overview of the different burners. So now I've got this, this, um, sorry, here. there we go. I've got this uh, fish piece that I made and it's carved out of basswood. So I can take my basswood 
And you can see when I take this, this scale tip, this is one of the scale tip types that we have. And just to give you an idea how that works, you can just take that and start, you're getting an idea how these scales form. And then when I push this down in here, these scale tips are available in different sizes and different, uh, different curves. So this particular one is five millimeters wide. And uh, it's a regular curve. The, the little round part on the back is regular. We make flat ones and we make deep ones. And uh, sizes from half a millimeter all the way up to uh, some of the scale tips are up to 12 or 14 millimeters. In this size, style, I think they go up to about eight or nine millimeters. But what I've done on this is I've drawn a kind of a grid to give me a, 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 a just to make sure that I sort of maintain a bit of a, um, consistency with it you know I don't get way out of line on my and usually you just start somewhere and you can line up the edges and just keep on pushing in your your tip like that and after a while you've got a you've got a fully scaled textured surface here so you can see i've just done a few but you can see how those and you kind of go over and you cover the entire area as you get uh further back on the fish sometimes the scale reduce in size so you may want two or three different two or three different sizes of scale tip to cover the entire fish and you know sometimes on the bottom they're a little smaller this is one style of fish scale tip that we make um the other ones are um I was just going to show you a, a, a whole different approach that we have to the scalers. This is a uh, kind of a little sharp hoop that is number 26 scale tips. Uh, the first one is on our website. These are the number 22 series. This is a number 26 series. And the way they're used, um, they're used at a lower heat setting. They don't require as much heat because they don't have the big metal thing on the end of them. But I've set this one up. See, they just make a little smile in the wood. And so for these little tiny scales up on the cheek of this fish, what I would do is I would just kind of go along in here and I would, because the whole idea is you want to create the effect of scales when you paint. When you go to paint this thing, I want some texture. I don't want just a smooth surface. So you can see how those little, how those little smiles have been put in. And you can actually, with a tip like this, you can just by holding it at the right angle, you can make these scales look a little shallower. You can roll it a little bit and make them wider and deeper. So you can actually vary the size of the scales just a little bit. And even on the edges of this, you can make them a little lighter so that they're not as pronounced. Um, you can have a lot more versatility with that. And you could do this on a snake or a lizard, or if you carved a dragon, if you're into carving fantasy figures or anything like that, you could carve a dragon and, and very quickly put the scales on it using a tip like this. We make other tips that, that work in exactly the same way, but instead of being sharp like this, and this is like kind of knife sharp, so it makes a real sharp little line. We make another one that's just unsharpened wire and it would make a heavier line. Um, these are the number 29 series. And then we have other ones that, that burn a half a scale, um, like this little tip here that will burn. When you're burning, you burn a half a scale at a time. It's sort of like this, but it, it's not as realistic a scale. And then the, finally, um, a series that just burns, you can see this burns an entire, it burns the outside of the scale rather than burning the scale itself. So those are some of the basic approaches we've got to scale making. And they should pretty much meet any of your needs. Um, you're going to be doing that way. So before I get into the next little bit with the, uh, you know, maybe caricatures and more utility stuff, does anybody have any questions about the the scale part of things? Tim, there is a question in the chat whether or not you have anything painted to show uh, how the scales stand out. Um, after you've burned them? Um, you know, I actually have to apologize for that. I've got a little Northern Pike at home that I was gonna bring and I forgot it. Um, I was gonna show you that little Northern Pike. I think I have, I have a Northern Pike carving that's kind of in our, in our uh, it's in storage right now in the room beside me. I'm just gonna 
see, I've got a, someone here helping me. They're going to go and see if they can find it so I can get back to that later. Um, but unfortunately, I, I don't have one right now. Um, or like at this, oh, there it is. It just magically showed up. Here's this little tiny northern pike. Now, this guy was burned. I have to keep moving it around so you get access. Can you? Yeah, you can see the scales there. This was burned with a, a half millimeter scale tip. So using the same technique that I just showed here with these guys, only instead of being five millimeters, half a millimeter. So these are one tenth the size of these. Um, just give you an idea how, how kind of crazy we get with, um, with the kind of tips we make. We have a half millimeter scale tip. Where it's nice because these scale tips are, uh, they're very consistent, very uniform because we have metal laser cutting equipment here. So they're all, all those tips are cut on metal lasers and uh, on a metal laser. So they're very consistent from one to the next. If you damage or lose one, you can get one that's exactly like it next round. And you can also see with this little things like the little holes in the, in the underside here, some of the lines on the gills and that kind of thing, those are all put in with wood burning as well. A lot easier to do that with a wood burner than it is to do it with, uh, and even the, the little rays in the fins and so forth were easier to do with a wood burning with a, with a carving tool. Uh, it's a glass eye that I put in here as well. So there, that helps. Anything else? Okay, um, I'll take the silence to mean no. And so for, for other kinds of uh, work, like somebody had, had asked about signing, signing your work. Um, I have a little uh, as an example. I have a little wood turning here that I, um, little wood turning here that I did years ago. I haven't quite finished all the texturing on it yet. Um, this is actually turned out of, uh, I turned this, but this is turned out of beach um, and uh, spalted beach. And I started doing some feather texturing on it. I, I carved all these feathers into it and I started doing the feather texturing. So I've got to finish the carving and I've still got some work to do on it. But, um, you know, I started doing the signing on it. Um, I, I'm working on a book on pyrography and I, I use this as one of the photographs. So that's why I haven't finished the signing on it yet. I will finish it when I, but I'm not going to do that until I actually get finished carving it. So I'm hoping to get it done before 2030. Although I could probably put 2030 in here if I really had to. Some of you guys know how that works. You work on a project for 10 years or more before you actually get it done on and off. So for signing, um, what a lot of people use is just a little ball tip like this. Um, these are a, uh, basically our standard writing tip that's got a, a one six, this one's a one sixteenth inch chrome ball, uh, chrome steel ball welded onto the end. The, um, I'll just get it heated up so that we can, again, anything that's got anything welded on the end, like a scale tip or a ball tip, um, any of those kind of things take a little longer to heat up than if they don't have anything welded onto the end. You gotta give them a minute to heat up. Um, but once they heat up, and it helps to turn on the power to the tip, once they heat up, uh, they stay fairly consistent. So this guy is coming along. You can see it starting to add a little, get a little darker. There we go. Tip is hot now. And for us, that's a, that's a longer time heating up than say a, a sharp hair tip or something like that. But you can see how this works just as you put it in. And if you wanna use it, um, the trick in doing these things is with most woods, is to not push too hard. And if you wanted, like I've got this one on my P88 set at 580 right now, and you can see how, how dark that burn is. If I want to increase the, push it up to 625, and you'll see you can get a much darker burn out of it if you want. But the nice thing about the ball tips, they're kind of buttery smooth no matter what angle. You put them at and they ride through the wood. We make ball tips all the way from, I show you the smallest ball tip in the world right here. Believe it or not, you can't really see it in here, but believe it or not, there's a, a chrome steel ball on the end of this. It's 1 64th of an inch in diameter, 0.4 millimeters or less than a half a millimeter in diameter. And you can use this exactly the same way for writing. Um, so we go all the way from 0.4 millimeters up to, uh, gosh, 
it's they, they get pretty big um, 2.8 2.9 millimeters or even three millimeters that kind of thing so they get to be a pretty good size and you would use those for signing whatever you want to whatever you want to do like here's a little boot a million people do that um, you know you would sign you would sign this one I'm signing it differently because this boot was carved by my dad so you know that's the way he would sign it he would just sign it along that way obviously it's one that's not done yet but um then you can also use it for things like you know quick and easy way of putting the lace holes into the boot an example if you wanted to burn the along the top here like the the toe i would normally suggest that what you want to do with that before you actually start burning is take a pencil and draw those lines in but you know do it that way and if you had stitching you know you can you can put in stitching uh, one way or the other you can put stitching along the the sole there's a million different things you can do if it was a like if you'd carved a red wing boot you could put the red wing logo or something in there there's a lot of different stuff that you can do you can put wrinkles and, and things like that in the wood with just with a a ball tip like this or it's it's other counterpart is just a just a basically a wire tip that doesn't have the ball on the end of it you can use it much in much the same way but it doesn't give you quite as much symmetry in the ball you know it's it it works in much the same way so those are a couple of the ideas there the other could thing you show that, us, could you show us writing with cursive versus just the uh, the uh, letters Not knowing if there's a certain size you recommended for cursive. No, um, it depends on how big you're. Like this, this one sixteenth inch ball, which is one of our more popular ones. Uh, the one point two millimeter and one point five millimeter, like this, these are our two most popular ball sizes, and uh, it, you can you can use them for cursive writing. Um, and one of the things that I, I do recommend quite strongly, especially if you haven't done a lot of this, is to um, to write out what you're going to do first with a pencil, right? So, um, uh, uh, I just scribbled out carvers there. If whatever you want to do, then what you can do is now you can take your uh, take your ball tip and just kind of, without pushing too hard, kind of go over your pencil marks. This is one of the things that has made pyrography such a popular um, pastime for so many people is you can actually take rubber stamp a design on something and you or you can write something or draw something we have paper that you can run through a photocopy or this pyro paper that you can run through a pyrography transfer paper that you can run through a photocopier stick it down on a piece of wood and burn right through it so you don't have to be able to draw or anything like that you can but you you just want to be able to follow lines if you can follow the lines you can you can uh, make it all work. So it's just a matter of kind of writing it out first and then away you go. You can't go uh, with a wood burning pen, you can't go as quickly as you would with a pencil. If you sign things real quickly, you wouldn't be able to do that with a wood burning pen. You have to slow it down because the tip needs time to recover its heat. Is that clear? Ken, there's a question in the chat about what ball tip you would use to do the nostril of a duck decoy. You have some specific? Yeah, well, usually uh, uh, most bird nostrils aren't round. And uh, so if, if you use this tip to do a bird nostril, you'd either have to push it in and then move it back and forth to, to elongate the nostril, or you could just take, uh, I don't have one in front of me right now, but it, you could just take the the same tip as this basically that doesn't have the ball welded onto the end and you see because it's now it's going to create an elongated slot when you push it into the wood um i think i'm getting a number nine tip here handed to me yeah this is just the same basic idea without the ball on the end of it and if you're going to be doing a, a duck nostril i just happen to have a duck here um if you're going to be doing the duck nostril what you do is you you'd put it in this way you know so that you create a an elongated slot and um you know for duck carvers we had 
uh, diving ducks have fairly long elongated nostrils and a dabbling duck like a mallard or a pintail, their nostrils are not quite as elongated. So, you know, you just use, uh, you'd use this tip to, to create that. If, um, if you're doing a miniature or something like that, what I've done is I've taken a, a little sharp tip like this and just, I'm not using a ball tip. I put the sharp tip in there and then you can use the heat to just wiggle it back and forth a little bit and it'll, it'll round things out. A lot of times the heat is, is going to help you a lot uh, when you want to elongate or change a hole, or you can even use it to carve, you know, you can carve away a little bit of the wood if you're using the heat. So that was a very good question. And how about um, safety tips for dealing with the smoke that's generated? Well, um, the, the best thing to do when you're burning uh, is to have some kind of a fan that's pulling the air away from you. Um, that's, that's the best way. So you're not kind of breathing the smoke, uh, specifically I've got a little, I, I do have our little, uh, we, we actually make a little, maybe switch to the other camera there. It might be easier to see it. Um, we have a little smoke extracting fan here that we make, uh, we manufacture these and, uh, they're, they're quite quiet. So I've got it running right now on the, on low speed. And uh, when you're burning, you can set it, you can set it on the table like this, you know, right here and then burn beside it and all the smoke gets drawn up that way. Or you can lay it on its side and use it more like a, a hood type thing where it'll draw the fan, the, the smoke in and it exhausts out the back. You have a little carbon filter in the back here. There's a carbon filter in the front too. And um, these work really, really well for, for general use. You can put them on, on the low, low speed. They're, they're very quiet. They also have a higher speed that they move more air through. They're not a really high volume fan because you need the air needs a certain amount of time in the filter media in order to, to get the, the smoke particles out. Now I didn't, um, I didn't, I wasn't, haven't been using this during the demo just because I'm thinking with the audio and everything, that little drone in the background, even, even it's on quiet. I didn't know like when it's running on the lowest setting. Uh, I didn't know if that would kind of show up and, and end up being kind of annoying or distracting. So I've been working without the smoke extractor. That's probably one of the best. Uh, a lot of people will use, um, you know, they'll, they'll wear a, an N95 mask if it's a particular issue for them, just like a lot of you do when you're carving with power tools, you wear an N95 mask or, or something more robust even than that. Um, so that's that's some of the ways you can you can manage that but you don't want a fan blowing on your work you want a fan that's pulling the air away from your workspace because fan air any air that blows over top of these tips um when you're working if air blows these are very fine metal tips you get a little air blowing across them, it'll cool the tips off and they won't work as well like they're, they're not as consistent it's another reason why wood burning most of the time is kind of an indoor sport i know there's people who do burn outdoors but if you live in saskatchewan it's windy up here all the time you don't want to be burning outdoors <laughs> it wouldn't really make any sense plus we only got about three months of the year that the weather's warm enough that you want to sit outside wood burning the rest of the time you want to be indoors any other questions I know there's been a few questions in the chat, Cam, but I think Ashley's in the uh, audience as well, answering some of those questions in the chat. So that's been good too. Oh, that's cool. That's great. Um, oh, I see. Uh, I'm, I'm actually told uh, Brad's the one who's answering those questions. Um, but anyway, so that's good. Brad's answering the questions for me. He's, he's kind of helping me here today. He just wants to stay in the background. Well, I've got a couple other little things that I just wanted to kind of show. And uh, these, these things are uh, more like related to the caricature or the utility type carving. These are a couple of things that my dad did. Um, dad retired in 1990 and uh, he started carving after he retired. I've been carving a lot longer than that. So I kind of taught him how to carve, but um, unfortunately dad passed away in August and, but he left a, a real nice legacy of a whole bunch of different carvings. Uh, that he had done over the years and he he liked doing things like boots and caricature and, and kind of caricature animals and things like that but he also carved a lot of earrings you see this little cactus here it's got a little hook on the end and he carved a lot of earrings for people and my mom was always wearing these uh these carved earrings that my dad made but this is a great example of you know he carved these little cactus out of basswood and he would use the wood burning tool just to burn little lines on them in preparation for painting them so when you paint the piece um 
you know, his, his wood burning, he burned pretty deep on this one. And actually he, he used the, the wood burning tool as a starting point to run his, his little, he had a little rotary tool, one of our little micro motors with a small diamond burr on it. And he would run that down the wood burning line to, to carve it a little bit. And it just made the carving a lot easier with something this little. And dad wasn't, he, he used hand tools. He liked using gouges and chisels and stuff, but not on something this tiny way better to use something like a little micro motor tool and, and diamond. So that kind of gives you an idea on some of the things that wood burning can help you with that. And then even things like this little, you know, this little duck that he carved here, um, just taking the wood burner and burning lines to, to delineate the feathers and uh, around the bill, put a couple of eyes in it, tail feathers. And uh, I don't have a painted one of these, but you know, again, some of the stuff that, that people like carving, um, you know, things of this nature, uh, dad would burn all the little cracks and crazed lines and make it look weathered and worn out and burn lines in the teeth and, and in the horns and that kind of stuff to make these things look a lot more antique. And again, I apologize. I, I couldn't find the, any of the finished ones. Um, they're kind of in storage, but it, you know, it kind of gives you an idea of some of the, the utility there that, uh, that you can do with that. Um, my own, my, my only foray into, uh, caricature carving was uh, again, this had, relates back to my parents, um, but dad had a, uh, mom and dad had a, uh, a 1974 Volkswagen Super Beetle convertible, little lime green convertible that they, they'd take to show and shines and different car events all over the place. And uh, this is uh, like this in one of the things, this, this is my folks um, say dad's gone, mom's doing great, but, if you look at this you'll see mom's wearing a pair of cowboy, cowboy boot earrings and uh you know those are carved in homage to dad he'd set up at show and shines with this little bob's parking only thing and they had these little stuffed frogs that they would put all around their display and and things of that nature so um you know we, we've kind of you know a little squashed frog driving over the and that kind of thing so having a lot of fun uh, having a lot of fun doing this kind of thing I've kind of uh, inherited the Volkswagen now. So we're gonna be doing a few car shows and things like that over the course of the summer. So maybe somebody will at some point do a caricature of me in the Volkswagen, I don't know. But um, to give you an idea of, of where wood burning is used, I, I burned all of the, you know, all of the hair. Uh, mom's hair was burned, dad's hair was burned, his sideburns, his mustache. And there's a number of different little details that were done like on the boots and things like that, little lines and things of that nature. And you can use it for delineating the door lines and the doorknob and tail lights and things like that in preparation for painting. Beautiful thing about doing wood burning on something like this before you paint is that you never lose your lines. They're, they're there permanently. And uh, even when you're uh, another process that you can do if when you're carving is you can use a wood burned line to act as a stop cut. Um, you know, you, you burn a line down and then you can carve into that line or you can carve over the line or, or sand over the line and the line won't disappear like a pencil line will. So I found wood burning to be very, very useful for even, even things like that. So I think that's probably all I've got for, you know, prepared stuff. Um, I think we're, we've done fairly good with the time anyway. Hey, Cam, what's the uh, best place that people can find your work? And also, where is the best place for them to go to buy stuff? Well, we have uh, a couple of things with the, with the wood burners. We have our, our website, razortip.com, and everything we make is on that website and available through there. We ship uh, off razortip.com. We ship within North America. We don't uh, do international sales through the website. If we have international customers, you can email us uh, with what you're interested in. We can make arrangements using PayPal and various things like that. So that's an option still. Um, we also have dealers really all around the world. We have dealers in England and Holland and uh, Norway. Oh boy, Denmark, number of different places, France. I don't want to miss anybody, but you know, they're quite scattered around the world, but we also have a lot of dealers in North America, like Lee Valley Tools and Woodcraft Supply, um, and uh, companies like Greg Dorrance and Kling Spores and Chipping Away. And uh, oh, I, I, I hesitate to mention because if I miss somebody, I'm going to get an email from them saying, how come you didn't mention me? Um, but uh, you can email us as well, and uh, we'll tell you, we, we can give you information on, on uh, dealers if you don't have like a you know, local woodcraft or something like that, that you can, that you can check out.
So they are quite available and you can also all phone us too. Like we, you don't have to buy our stuff online. You can phone us and we can do orders that way. Uh, we're quite approachable. All right, any other questions for Cam and chat? There was a question whether or not you have social media yourself, Cam, to show off your carvings and your work. No. <laughs> I, it's something that I would, I would love to engage and love to do. Uh, I do have a, uh, a Facebook page, but I don't, I'm not active on it at all. Um, I set it up so that, because we have a classroom here, that's where I'm broadcasting from is, you know, where we're going from here is our, our classroom space. It got shut down because of COVID. Uh, we had our last class here in March of uh, 2000 and it kind of ended up classroom space ended up getting taken over by our R and D department. So it's a real mess right now for classes, but uh, we do hope to get the classroom space up and running again. And I, I'm, I've been active when we have classes active on Facebook for the classroom, for the razor tip classroom. Um, my carving, I'm not really prolific. I'll spend three or four years on a single piece and then I'll take it to the world championships and then bring it back. And we, we kind of featured on our, our catalog covers and things of that nature. But uh, honestly, I'm not really much of a self promoter when it comes to my car. I carve really for the enjoyment of it. I just love doing the work. Um, I can get lost in a piece for three or four years. And I'm almost kind of disappointed when it finally, when I finally finish it, um, because you kind of get connected to it. Um, but un unfortunately, and I do apologize, it's not something that I, you know, particularly proud of, but I, I would rather be spending my time carving than posting on a, on a social media site. And that's maybe a, a, a bit of my generation on that as well. I don't know, but um, there's a lot of bird carvers that are very, very active on, on particularly on Facebook that I've seen, but uh, I'm, I'm not at present. And I do hope to, to correct that over the next number of months to start uh, getting a bit of a presence there. Um, as we make some changes here, I'm hopeful that I'll have a little bit more time to start posting a little bit more about my passion for carving. Um, one thing that, you know, running a company like Razor Tip for the number of years, um, you know, it's, it's wonderful. It's great. I, I love every aspect about it, but at heart, I am a carver and I'm, I'm looking forward over the next few years to getting back more into the carving side of things rather than uh, the running of Razor Tip side of things. So well, I can say about that for now. Hey, Cam, I'm a, a big fan of your products. Um, you didn't tell the folks on the call about uh, your awesome tip repair service. Ah, yeah. Well, um, you know, we, we do repair our pens. Uh, if somebody breaks a tip, you can send the pens back to us. I'm, unfortunately, there's a dark cloud on the horizon with that right now. Um, Canada Post and U.S. Postal Service has just cranked up their rates and started we used to be able to sneak them through as in an envelope as letter mail uh, for like a dollar dollar and a half and uh, in from some areas people have tried sending pens back and the cost is up to like eight or nine dollars to mailing one way for a pen which is really you know making it questionable for some people whether it's worthwhile doing uh, we still do that um, and but I, I'm not sure exactly how much longer that's going to be an option for us thanks to uh, Canada Post and U.S. Postal Service uh, we, we're willing, but um, other forces are at work. Any other questions for Cam at this time? Yeah, I had a question that was in the um, chat. I'm sorry you guys didn't see it, but you probably answered already, but I'm not sure. Um, are there any um, retailers, local re retailers in Columbia, South Carolina that would carry razor tips so I can get one today? Because I've been looking, I, I can't find seem to find anybody. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with exactly where the woodcraft stores are in South Carolina. Um, if that, uh, I think Brad's checking to see if there was anybody nearby there, but I, I don't know that there is anybody really close by. Um, you know, we don't, we wouldn't have anybody that's really local. I know that uh, I think Kling Spores is in North Carolina, Hickory, North Carolina. Um, but we don't, I don't think we have anybody that you could just kind of drive to and, and pick it up this afternoon. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I went online and looked at the, um, the smoke filters yeah. and I'm a little confused. Are there, are there two different filters, a pre-filter and then a regular, the upper filter? Yeah. The, the, and... 
an expansion so you can actually add a third filter? Is that how that works? Yeah, the, the unit is quite simple. You buy it like this and plug it in and start using it. It's ready to go. But in the bottom of it here, there's a little padded pre-filter. This is a, a little carbon pad that goes in. Uh, there are some some uh, like smoke extracting fans that have been on the market for a long time, made in China, that this is what they use. They use a filter like this. And our units use that as a pre-filter. So it goes through there first. And then on the top, um, on the top of the unit, there's another carbon grid filter here. This is a, a much more substantial filter. And the air passes through that on the way out of the, out of the unit. So it's actually two stages of filtration. And if you wanted more filtration, the, the more time the air spends in the filter media, the, the more effective it is at pulling the, the smoke particles out of the air. Um, and if you wanted to, you can actually take this, this top piece off and add a little expansion thing in here. So you put two of the grid filters on and put the top on, it adds another inch to the top of the unit. And so it gives you a little bit more filtration. It's just kind of an option that you can get. It, it does reduce the amount of air moving through the, the unit by a small amount when you add another filter. See, these filters aren't like a, a mask filter or anything where it's a, a particle, like a, um, a cloth or any, a cloth or a paper or anything where the, the particles go through. It's actually, you can see light through that carbon filter and you can, you can see light through the pre-filter. Um, they don't restrict a lot of airflow, but the important thing is that the air, as it passes over the carbon media, the smoke particles get trapped by the carbon. So you, you, you can't have the air moving through too fast and, um, you've, you've got to have uh, exposure of the air to the, to the carbon media so that it actually works. So it doesn't get 100% of the smoke, but boy, it makes a huge difference. When we were prototyping and testing these things, uh, we noticed a massive difference in our R&D area when we were using them versus when we weren't. So um, they work really, really well that way. But, but for the, the two stages are right in the unit. You don't have to buy two separate things or anything like that. And you can replace the filters. They're not that expensive. They last quite a while. And uh, they're really easy to replace. No tools required. Thank you. Okay. And just a comment from Murray Lincoln, <clears throat> of Saskatchewanite originally. And I have, I bought my first uh, and my only uh, razor tip back in about 1997. And it's still chugging along. Yeah. I've a lot of tips have gone out and pens have broken and thought, but the, the unit is still burning. Well, that's kind of neat to hear. And I know I've got, I know people that are used, still using the, the first burner they bought from me back in 1984, 1985. They're still using those burners and our cords and pens that we make today will work on those burners and, and they're, you know, they're, they're worthwhile. That's part of the thing we're really proud of. We, we have a desire that you buy a burner from us today and 25 or 30 years from now, that burner is still serviceable and, and worth, worth owning. Uh, we're not interested in planned obsolescence. I never have been. I've been primarily, I've been building burners for myself more than anything else. Those digital burners that I showed you, the P80 and the P88, those are my dream burners. I, I've got the ability to build whatever burner I want. We spent a lot of money bringing those things into production. Um, and that's the burner I use at home. And because I just, I love the way they work. It's my, my dream burner. So I'm not just building stuff to sell. I'm burn, I'm, I build all these things more for myself and, and for my friends and people that take classes from me. I've, I've done a lot of presentation at things like wood turning conferences and that. And we identified years ago, we needed to get something that had a way higher heat output. The challenge was everything that we make has to be safety certified. And to get that really high heat output, we weren't able to do that for many years until we did a complete redesign on our pens with all the stuff we've learned over the years. And now we're able to get safety certification on these tools that have a, a crazy amount of heat output, way more than anything we've ever made in the past. So, you know, again, that was more done for friends of mine who have a need for the, the high heat. But um, I, I, it's, it's neat to hear that from guys like Murray about, uh, you know, you've had it for a long time. That's what our goal is. We we're not interested in things breaking down three years from now. We have to buy a new one. That's not the way we do business. It's really hey, I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a, a wood burner from somebody else's company, and the pens themselves get very hot to the touch. How, how do your hand, pen handles compare in terms of being overheating? Well, if, if we can just go to the, the close-up view here again for a second, guys, um, to switch back over to that. Some of the things over the years that none of our competitors have in the pens, we have these, these this is ceramic on the front end. 
of our pens. The ceramic acts like a heat sink that radiates heat out. The, the whole goal is to keep the heat from the tip getting into your fingers when you're working with it. And the, the, the brass gets hot, the ceramic starts getting hot. We have ventilation all the way around the bottom. There's, there's air movement through here. We have ventilation in the mid body of the pen and there's little vent holes in the back of all of our pens. So the air moves freely through the whole pen. They're the only ones on the market that do that. Um, and uh, you know we've designed the, the length and the tip design and everything to try to give us the, the least amount of heat transferred back up into the pen. We use these foam grips. We do make a, what we call an extreme silicone grip that I know a lot of the wood burning artists use that are, they're a little bigger and they're made out of silicone and they, they even add better insulation. They can just be added on. You just, on, on our regular pens, you just slide the grip off, slide the grip off and you can slide one of the silicone grips onto it. Um, so th the answer is that if you're burning really hot, like if your tip is red hot, you're going to have a certain period of time where this, the pen starts to get a little uncomfortable. And it varies from one person to the next. Like my wife is our best heat testing person in the world because she's got very sensitive fingers. And she'll say, oh, that's starting to feel really warm. And I'll pick it up and go, oh, it's hardly even warm at all to me. Like I'm, I'm kind of numb in the fingers, I guess. But um, it depends on the person. But the thing is, if you're burning a lot and you have to burn hot, one of the things I recommend is getting two of the same pen and just swapping them back and forth. If it's really important for you to burn hot and a lot, when the pen starts getting warm, you just swap them out um, and, and just keep going back and forth between the two pens. But the answer really is that of all the pens in the world right now, this is like eighth or ninth generation for us in making pens. We've taken everything we've learned in nearly 40 years of making these things and you won't find a pen that runs cooler than these ones will. That's uh, kind of the short answer. All right, Cam, well, we're coming up on about 25 after five on the East Coast. So uh, I'll go ahead and, and say that maybe one more question if we have any other questions in the chat. Okay. Well, I just want to say thanks for coming on today, Cam. Uh, thanks for your assistant too, uh, as far as answering the questions in the chat. It's been a big help. Uh, I will say I've had one of your burners probably six or seven years, and I'll agree with Murray. Uh, it's, it's never given me any problems at all. It's a really uh, solid machine, uh, and you don't ever have to wonder whether or not it's going to work, and you know the tips have held out well and everything. So anybody out there who, uh, who's interested in getting one, I say you ought to go for it. Uh, go out and get you one. Uh, there's several places you can go out to find them. I know in the Charlotte show that's coming up next Saturday uh, that I'll be at, uh, we'll probably have a couple of uh, people there that sell wood burners. Um, and you should be able to at least buy one there or maybe place an order there. So if you're in the area, make sure you come out to that show. Uh, just want to remind everyone again, uh, next week we'll have T, uh, Steve Tomaschek on from, uh, from Germany. He's coming on. Uh, he's going to talk to us about carving miniatures. He's got a couple of books that he's going to come on and talk about. Uh, so make sure you join us. Uh, we'll be back next week at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so it's the same Zoom number. I uh, just want to thank all of the people that's come on to see the wood burning today. Uh, if you're not a carver and you're interested in our meetings, you're welcome to come on every week. Again, we meet at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so come on and join us. And uh, there's a lot of good information that we share during these meetings. Just want to thank you all for coming on a little later today. Um, thanks for joining us with the International Association of Wood Carvers, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>